for the technology that we've been working on in set, that continuum. Uh, NUMBA is one of the exciting projects we do at Continuum, and I'm really pleased that Sue Kwan Lam is going to join me today for this webinar to show off some of the latest things. Uh, some of it is uh, new, some of it is older, uh, but all of it's exciting. Uh, one of the things we've done recently is made uh, NUMBA able to access the GPU directly. Now, we for at least a year and a half have had an Accelerate product that accesses the GPU uh, for commercial folks who are buying our products, they, could, they can access the GPU from Python. And uh, we've open sourced a kind of low-level version of that called CUDA Python, and we've made that available. We'll be able to show you that and talk about that today. I wanted to start by just giving a little more background about uh, Continuum and who's going to be talking to you today. Um, Su Kwan Lam is a primary number developer, principal number pro developer. He's a software engineer at Continuum Analytics. He also uh, works on LLVM Pi. Uh, these technologies, Numba and Numba Pro, rely on the LLVM library, which is a C++ library, and Sue has created a binding to that library in Python called LLVM Pi. It builds off of some work of a, of a previous author, but he's essentially re, redone a lot of it in order to make it uh, accessible and useful for the Numba project. And then my name is Travis Oliphant. I've been around the scientific Python community for a long time, uh, notably on the SciPy project and the NumPy project. I uh, started the Numba project. Uh, when we started a company about two years ago, uh, really wanting to enable high-level access to the GPU, make it just easier for all of us who are domain experts who want to do data analysis, who want to do image processing and use the GPU, to do it more quickly with simpler code and fewer lines and much less effort. Uh, that's actually one of the reasons we started Continuum Analytics. Continuum Analytics is a company that is dedicated to helping domain experts. We see ourselves as, as a uh, Microsoft for domain experts. If Microsoft helps developers to build applications for everybody, Continuum builds uh, tools and a platform to help domain experts, quants, geophysicists, scientists, engineers, to create tools, applications, uh, useful products to enable analysis and insight from large-scale data or small-scale data as well. Uh, we have a few products. Uh, if you check them out at our website, uh, learn more about Wakari. I'll actually show a little bit of Wakari today because we'll use it and we'll give people who attend the webinar uh, free access to a, to a preview release of our cloud version of Wakari that's uh, emerging, which is a newer model, newer version. They'll have access to a GPU in the cloud. Uh, we make it easy to access hardware. We make it easy to access uh, environments that have all the Python uh, stack. Uh, including NumPy, SciPy, and that sort of thing. Anaconda Server is based, it, it gives you uh, easy ability to create environments and behind your firewall mirror our repositories so your internal folks don't have to come go to the web, they can go to an internal box. You can have a little more control over uh, blending the open source packages with your own proprietary packages. Then we also offer training, uh, practical Python, Python for finance, Python for science and engineering, and then we do consulting. We uh, build projects, we build web apps, we build native apps. We help people in any area of the analysis, visualization, scalable computing or, or scientific computing and enterprise Python. Uh, just a little bit about us in case you're, uh, a lot of people aren't aware of some of the things we do as we uh, get more and more people who are affiliated with Continuum. Uh, our goal is to offer as many easy to use products as we can for that class of domain experts. Uh, two cloud offerings you may be aware of that we also offer uh, Wakari.io is a cloud version of our uh, enterprise product, Wakari uh, Enterprise. It, it lets you essentially just open a browser and do data analytics with Python. It gives you there's a free account, very minimal resources. If you pay more, you can get actual access to real resources in the cloud and do your analytics there in an IPython notebook or in a terminal or uh, exactly as you want. We also recently come out with BizStar. Uh, you can log in for free and get a free account. It lets you ship and all of your packages, your binaries. It's an extension of Anaconda Server, basically, but it's in the cloud. It's also free for if you want to freely give away your packages, you can freely get an account and use it. So those are our uh, cloud offerings. Uh, one thing at Continuum is we're very committed open source. Um, my background is developing SciPy, uh, creating NumPy. I'm really a believer in a commit, committed to open source software and uh, encourage all of our developers to contribute to open source as well. Some of those we do as a company and some individual developers just contribute to the projects you see on this screen, SimPy, NumPy, SciPy, many in the SciPy stack. And this is, this is what I could remember at the time I made the slide. There are more here I'm sure I'm missing. Uh, we're re eager to interact with uh, the open source community and build the, build the space. 
Uh, Continuum itself has a series of open source projects, as some of you may be aware of. Uh, Blaze is a very ambitious, uh, scalable, efficient table and area computing story. It's extended glue for big data. Uh, there's subparts to the Blaze project, a data shape project, which is a data description, array, and table-based language for data. Dyned is a C++ multidimensional array library with Python bindings and BLZ columnar store. Uh, Blaze is, is emerging, but look for later this fall some exciting announcements about Blaze and the progress of Blaze. Uh, Bokeh is taking off, and it's a fantastic interactive visualization of large data in the browser. It's basically D3 for non-JavaScript programmers. As a Python programmer, you can build interactive visualizations in the browser, in IPython Notebook, and elsewhere. Uh, Numba is what we're going to talk about today, particularly how Numba enables you to use the GPU. It's an optimizing Python compiler. And then Conda is our package manager. And PyParallel is an early story and a beta Python patch to remove the gill for parallel context and allow you use, your use of all cores from a high-level language like Python. I definitely want to encourage everybody to go out and try Anaconda. It's a free Python distribution for everybody. It's, it's free for commercial use. It's free for personal use. You can use it as many machines as you want. It's an easy to install distribution of Python with uh, over 100 libraries, including the NumPy stack and everything around it. Uh, Conda install Anaconda. I, I put that there to remind me to tell you that the biggest feature of Anaconda is actually the Conda package manager. And you can just get the Conda package manager by downloading mini Conda at the Conda.pedit data site as well. It's the easiest way to get the tools we're going to talk about. If you want to get Numba, Numba try it out. If you want to try Numba Pro, Conda install Numba, Conda install Numba Pro, make them available for you on your machine, whether, whether it's Mac, Windows, or Linux. The big picture of what we're trying to do is really enable domain experts, as I mentioned. We see there's enormous data available. There's fancy hardware available, GPUs, uh, and uh, there's other APUs, mixes of CPUs and GPUs. There's this modern hardware emerging. Uh, there's huge data, and people want to process those data with that fancy hardware. But domain experts don't want to become programmers to do it. They want to be able to use high-level languages. And uh, we see ourselves as uh, that nexus of uh, helping domain experts to use advanced data, large data and advanced hardware, to actually enable insights and other important business decisions. An important part of the way we enable this is to promote array and table-oriented computing. Think in terms of arrays and tables. Uh, we believe that arrays, array-oriented or table-oriented computing, you can imagine, use NumPy, use Pandas, instead of writing low-level for loops. That's basically the concept. But more importantly, it's also organizing your data. So your data isn't a list of Python objects. Your data is a NumPy array, either an array of structures or structure of arrays, uh, depending on the situation. If you express your algorithms like that, then you can take advantage of parallelism accelerators, and you can have the compilers do that for you. So we really encourage array expressions, and we're trying to promote tools that really take advantage of the hardware with when you write your code in that way. So I'm going to talk about Numba, and we're going to shortly turn the time over to Sue, who's going to walk us through even more examples of Numba. Uh, but I want to give a little bit of oversight of Numba, what it is. Numba derives from NumPy and Mamba. The black Mamba is the fastest snake. So it's a corny little kind of union of the idea of numeric Python and fast. Uh, and it really leverages the LLVM library. Uh, I think the LLVM library is a fantastic tool that really uh, gives us a plateau and a place to cooperate. Uh, and I really try to emphasize that what Numba does is essentially make Python, or more formally, a subset of Python, a subset of Python on equal footing with C++, C, and Fortran. You basically can write a subset of Python, and it produces the same code that, that CLang is going to produce from your C++ code. It produces this IR, this intermediate representation that LLVM uses to then generate code for x86, for ARM, or, or for GPUs. That's what the PTX stands for. So Numba turns Python into a compiled language with a GPU target. That's an important concept to wrap your mind around in order to understand what's happening. So at the end of the day, you are writing code just as if you were writing C++ code. It can be as fast. It can be as performant. Uh, but you're able to use Python syntax. Now, uh, it can be a little tricky because you're not necessarily able to use all the Python data structures. You can't necessarily use a Python list and dictionary in all the ways you want in the full dynamism that you might in other contexts, because that does have implications. If you try to write that way, it might be slower. So, uh, but if you write Python, particularly with NumPy arrays, particularly with array-oriented computing, and use some of the concepts that NumPy has promoted, then you can get the speed you're looking for with simplicity. Uh, and then we also are introducing and have introduced CUDA Python. It's now open source. It's exactly parallel to CUDA C, 
and you can write in Python syntax. It's a low-level kind of way of writing, but it's the syntax is simple, but it's still you have to you have to think differently and make sure you're writing correctly to use CUDA Python effectively. So it's not the it's not the end result we all like to get to, which is very high-level programming that takes advantage of the GPU, but it's definitely a step in that direction. And just to give you a preview, a simple like a black shoulder example, this is available in number pro examples on our GitHub repository, as indicated in this slide. Um, and incidentally, these slides will all be available. There'll be a recording available. There'll be links to the notebook that we're showing. Uh, and in addition, we're going to allow you to uh, access a preview release of the upcoming Wakari Cloud. Wakari Cloud exists now, but we're uh, changing it to a Wakari Cloud that's more consistent with our enterprise product. And that's, that, that change is happening in the next month or two. And uh, you can have a preview release that gives you access to a full Python environment where you can explore with the GPU. And everybody who attends this webinar will give you that access to that for basically until the weekend. We have a box running, uh, and we can bring up another box as well for if we have a lot of folks wanting to try it out. And you can use and try these examples on your own inside in a uh, GPU-enabled box in the cloud uh, through Akari. Uh, the URL for that will be mailed out. Uh, after the webinar, and so you can try it out, and we'll show you a little bit of examples of that as we're moving forward. So this just illustrates the kind of speed ups you can get to, to try to get you excited about what, what's possible. This is the reason GPUs have become so exciting to people and why people are trying to use them. They do help if your problem matches what GPUs can do. GPUs don't automatically make everything faster, but for certain cases, if your problem has a lot of parallelism, a lot of things that can be run together at the same time, and you can program to take advantage of that, and that's the big if. Uh, you can get real speed up. So we're going to show you some of the ways to do that. Here's a simple example of an embarrassingly parallel uh, task parallel problem. But with NumPy, that baseline you can speed up just with writing number code, take a, get rid of some of the overhead of the array creation, uh, some of the inefficiencies that are in NumPy itself, and get about 2x speed up if you just write the number code. But if you then move it to the GPU, you get another 10x above that. So with CUDA Python, you can get very large speed ups from even what you're used to. And that's what we're trying to make people, give people access to. So it's not just wait for somebody who's an expert in CUDA C to come and help you, but you as a domain expert can try to access the hardware you have and do it from Python and not have to change your, work, your, your workflow. So that's, with that, I want to move over to, uh, Excuse me, I muted myself instead of share a different thing. Uh, I'm going to start sharing my web browser. So you can all see that. What I'm showing you is basically uh, Sue has logged in to his Wakari account. And if you go to gpu.wakari.io after the webinar, uh, you can go now, but I, it would be great if everybody would wait. Uh, you can go now and, and sign up for an account. And when you sign up for an account, you will be accessed this main page, which shows all the projects you have available. And you can see that Sue has created a webinar project in his account. And you can click on that webinar project, and that shows the applications that are available for him, as well as files in his public folder. And if he clicks on, uh, so we click on that, and then you click on the IPython notebook, that starts an application, and then he has an IPython notebook webinar that he can point to. Uh, there's also a terminal application you can go there if you want to just do some low-level uh, uh, operating system style things, like uh, check out a Git repository, uh, get some uh, file from some, some other part of the Internet. It becomes a very nice uh, in environment in the cloud to start accessing data that you can't fit on your hard drive or to access compute resources you don't have available. In this instance, we're accessing a compute resource that has GPUs available. So everybody can try this out and so that we can show you the benefits using Numba uh, with CUDA with CUDA Python support can provide you. All right, so we're going to actually uh, going to hand this over to Sue, and he's going to walk through this notebook that we'll make available for everybody after the after the talk. Uh, he's going to walk through it in slide form. Thank you, Sue. All right. Hello, everybody. I'm Sue, and so. Uh, I'm going to talk through this notebook here. 
the original notebook was written and was running on the Bukhari GPU cloud that you will have access soon. And the slide is this a render of the same notebook with the research obtained from the GPU node um, on Bukhari. Um, so um, a little bit of review. So we're going to talk about Numba. It's the open source um, this optimizing compiler that can allow GPU programming in your Python programs. And there is currently only support CUDA. Soon there will be an OpenSphere support. And you can access within Wakari just by import number. And then we have a commercial number pro, which is extension to number that adds multi-core and GPU features. And we will walk through some of the GPU vectorized, GPU vectorized, I will explain what they are shortly. And I will show an example that uses uh, QFFT, which is available through uh, the CUDA toolkit uh, provided by NVIDIA. And number pro has a binding so that you can use to FST with Python and NumPy arrays. And for all the code that we're going to show, uh, whenever you see it is import from number pro, is a number pro only feature. Anything that's import from the number namespace, they are open, they are open source and it's free. Now again, you can easily access number pro just by importing it in the Mercari. So what is a CUDA GPU? It is a massively parallel processor. It sits on your PCI Express. Um, how massively parallel it is, it, is a, it can be a hundred threads. It, it can have a thousand threads running on it. Um, it is really optimized for data throughput. Instead of a three-level cache hierarchy that the CPU has, GPU uses a very shallow cache hierarchy. You should only one level or two. Um, and that, even with the cache, it is still best in many cases to use manual caching. And the cache memory is called the shared memory, and it's addressable. So you can store to a low from it. So the CPU, in contrast, is latency optimized. It has a deep cache hierarchy level one, L2, L3. So they have very different execution model. And you have to think differently during your program, the GPU. And here, she's showing just a little bit of code of this curing what GPU we are running on. So on the Wakari node, um, is a new a media grid K520. GPU, and its compute capability 3.0, uh, number requires 2.0 or better. And you can see, so the rest are showing how many multiprocessors it has. This one has eight, and each of them has a nine, uh, 192 cores per multiprocessor. Together there's 1,500 more threads on the entire GPU. So this gives you a sense of how much resources you can use comparing to your normal CPU, which has like eight to 16 hardware cores. We're going to start with a high level array oriented style to introduce programming GPU with Python. So with this style, as Travis has mentioned, we are going to use NumPy array as your basic unit of computation and the universal function concept, ufunc, as an abstraction of computation and scheduling. So what are ufuncs, universal functions? They are NMMI's functions. Whenever you use NumPy, you are already using ufuncs. Typical, the MP is the NumPy uh, namespace, the NumPy sign, NumPy add, they are all NumPy ufuncs. One way to build ufuncs easily is to use 
uh, vectorized. The CPU support is available in number. For GPU support, it's number pro only. Vectorize turns your simple scalar function in Python into an element-wise array function. Here's an example. The top function is a CPU version using number. So you use this vectorized decorator. You can pro it can be overloaded, have multiple type signatures. So here we have a single precision version and a double precision version. And we set the target to CPU. The rest is a scalar function that computes the sine of x multiplied by the cosine of y. And there's the CUDA version that uses the GPU. It use, it's, it's only available in number pro, so we use the number pro dot vectorize. The rest is similar to the CPU version. Hey, Sue. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me if I just step in. I just wanted to make sure everybody realized that they could ask questions at any time during the webinar. I know it's a little awkward because we're all staring into uh, our screens and kind of hearing the voice in the, in the, in the cloud. Uh, but feel free to ask questions. If you don't want to actually speak up and ask your question on the air, you can also type your question into the chat window. And uh, we, we have a few people here looking at those questions, and we can moderate them and, and uh, provide answers either via chat or also we'll, we'll discuss. Uh, I want to uh, – if there are any questions now, maybe we'll just wait a second to see if there are any questions yet. Um, uh, some of this material can be a little hard to explain, especially how much, depending on how much GPU experience you have. I mean, uh, Sue's done a great job of showing us kind of the, the basic concept of the GPU, is that there are thousands of cores running. You know, a lot of us hear about the coming uh, CPUs that will have many cores, and we do have 16, 32, there's even a few that are close to 100 cores on a CPU. But GPUs already out of the box, as you can see, have thousands of cores for us to use. Uh, one of the things when we thought about high-level targeting of these cores, realize that it's exactly uh, it, it, that the NumPy concept of vectorization, the NumPy concept of doing an element-by-element -element calculation on every element of an array is the heart of a UFUNC. We realize that that is a perfect map to the GPU architecture. And the, the, that's been the goal of number of vectorize, is to basically take and uh, one, let you write a new universal function in Python code. So that's what number vectorize does when you target the CPU. You can now easily write a new, very, very fast Python uh, universal function. Uh, and that's exciting all of in itself. Uh, in addition, with number pro, it's only available in number pro currently. Uh, you can target the GPU and make a universal function that uses the GPU. And I, I just want to mention, this is the easiest way I've ever seen to target the GPU just a simple Python function, and now you can, you can put as much code as you want as long as it's element-by-element element function, as long as it's a core, a kernel that runs on every element of an array. Target the GPU, and this will handle moving it to the GPU, executing that code, moving it back to the host, and you just are basically using the GPU like a really powerful floating uh, vector processor. And as, we, as you can see, as long as you're doing enough work on the GPU to justify copying the data back and forth, you get tremendous speed ups. Thanks, Sue. All right. Okay. Okay, so, um, so the UFUNC, uh, to explain a lot of this, something that I'm going to show as well. Um, so, really, Use the UFUNC, the vectorized UFUNC in action. So we can test it out on a median um, double array, on two median double arrays, and to use this simple sine x cosine x function that we just have. So um, in this slide, you see like the first session, we generate the data with x and, x and y. They are now NumPy arrays. They're all flow 64. They have a million elements in them. And then here, we can just use it very simply. Uh, the first line here, I'm going to highlight it. So this is the original NumPy version. The second line here is the CPU version, which uses number vectorized to generate. And then the GPU version. And a little bit of code to check that they are correct. 
and the benchmark. So what we see here is the results of all three versions of the same code. You can see NumPy and the GPU vectorized speed, they're similar. Because most of the time are dominated by the sine cosine math function. But for the GPU, it is nine milliseconds comparing to about 50 milliseconds in other versions. So it's a lot faster. This includes all the time spent on transferring data to and from the GPU. We have a couple of questions, too, mm -hmm. actually. Um, one is, what are the CUDA toolkit requirements? The current toolkit requirement is 5.5, and it's when you download, when you install Number Pro, part of the toolkit, there are a set of redistributable libraries, so we send those with Number Pro. For Number, you have to do an installation. Uh, there are certain GPU features for number, and you have to do a Conda install CUDA toolkit, and that would get extra CUDA toolkit libraries. But for driver support, that's the only thing that you must have is the driver coming with at least CUDA 5. But we, are, we do most of our testing developments on 5.5 driver for now. What if they have 6.0? That should just work. Should work with this. Mm -hmm. this, this, this work. Yeah. Driver is API is very, very stable. So that should be. Another question is: Is the implementation copying the data to GPU global memory for GPU vectorized, for example? Yes. So the data must go from the CPU RAM to the GPU's global memory, and the result is written back to the global memory and sent back to the host. CPU, RAM. We have more questions. There's a question about initial setup. Um, we'll actually get to that, I think, at the end. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, what I showed on that slide, uh, Conda install accelerate, will set, will set you up. Uh, I showed an initial slide about the Black-Scholes equation. That it basically showed how to create an environment using Conda, and Conda install accelerate would set you up. We'll also give everybody access to gpu.wakari.io, which will already have a full Anaconda with Accelerate library loaded, so you can use it. And if you want to learn more how to build it yourself, uh, well, Numba you can build yourself. Accelerate, you, you can only get the binary from us. If you want to build Numba yourself, the information for how to do that is on numba.pydata.org, including information on how, how to get CUDA Python working. All right. Thank you, Travis. Okay, go ahead. No, go ahead. We'll, okay. we'll keep going. Okay, so what's happened with uh, the vectorized view func? Um, so this is a little bit of explanation of what Number Pro did for us. There is an automatic memory transfer. All number arrays are automatically transferred from CPU to GPU and the research GPU to CPU. The work is automatically scheduled. There are a little bit of scheduling code in Number Pro, and but even the GPU does can handle some of the scheduling. Uh, if there's anyone who are often familiar with the CUDA implementation, uh, they would know there are schedulers and all that in the GPU. And there's automatic GPU memory management. So all the GPU memory, all those arrays when we transfer NumPy arrays to the CUDA GPU, they were copied, a device memory, what we call a device array, is created, and it's associated with the underlying actual GPU memory on the device. When that object goes away, it's freed. Uh, the underlying memory is freed. So you don't have to concern about CUDA free cleaning up the memory. It, and that avoids a lot of memory leak problem. I'm going to show another vectorized example. Now, this time, it's just a single type signature, uh, only single precision float. This will really show off how powerful the GPU uh, single precision float is. So the, some polynomial equations, power, square root, 
And then we generate the data. And we test to make sure everything's correct. And we show the benchmark. So we have NumPy, CPU vectorized as the number open source version. And then this is GPU vectorized only in number pro. And you can see for this function, even uh, our CPU version is a lot faster. And the reason behind it is likely to, due to uh, the allocation of temporaries when you use NumPy arrays. Because every operation, the P square, Q cube, R to the fourth degree, they all generate a temporary array. And then the, all the add and the square root, they generate a new array. And they keep allocating and deallocating. But for the number of vectorized, all those temporary creation is eliminated. So you only create the final result array. The GPU vectorized is similar. So you generate the result on GPU and transfer back. And the GPU version is even faster than our CPU version by almost a factor of two. There was a question about somebody who obviously knows a little more about CUDA programming is asking about the grid size and the block size for vectorize. Mm -hmm. And where is that decided and who, and who chooses it? So currently, number pro uh, uses, uses uh, some heuristic and it queries the driver for uh, the amount of resource usage, register, shared memory usage, and try to use a little bit of heuristic to determine the best um, occupants, the walk occupancy, and it, so that make sure it can run on it and runs at an optimal occupancy. The algorithm behind it is, is so if you have program code before you notice that the walk uh, occupancy calculator, so you do, do something like that but automatically for you. Another question from Alex, how many cores are used for CPU vectorized? Well, this CPU, uh, this version, this uses the open source version. It only has a single core support. So in number pro, there is a multi-core support. And so you can get more speed up. You can get more cores. Potentially, you can get more speed up. But I think our Wakari is limited to one core per user, so you may not be able to see much. Uh, yeah, if you just use the Wakari instance, mm -hmm. yeah. It's a trial mode. Yeah, the trial mode only has one core. Um, so, um, if you're wondering, so we have vectorized for scalar functions. What if you have an array? Uh, if so you have the function that you have uses array arguments, and then you can use the generalized u func. Um, the decorator is called GU vectorize. I might talk about this just a little bit, okay. if you don't mind. Uh, GU vectorize, it, a lot of people don't, aren't as aware of the generalized u func. Uh, the u func has been around in NumPy for a long time. And so most people also use sign and add and multiply, and they're used to u func, so you know what those are. Generalized u funcs are a little tricky because they're not as familiar, but they are in NumPy. Uh, they've been there for a while, actually, and they're really handy when you have something like, I, want, I have a, an array of a thousand by two by two. Maybe I have a thousand two by two arrays, and I want to do a dot product of those two by two arrays a thousand times. And I, I could write a for loop and do that, but the array-oriented or vectorized approach would be to write a single dot product and then have the fundamental unit of calculation be that inner uh, kernel, which is that inner two by two matrix multiplication. So generalized u funks lets you do that. Define a kernel, but instead of working on scalars, instead of working on just a single float or a single integer, you can work on a vector of, uh, or an array of data. And so those can be the inputs. And what's really nice about number, uh, number pro and the, is the ability to define these generalized u funks very easily. Uh, otherwise, you'd have to do some part of the C programming in order to build generalized u funks. But you can. They've been available in, number, in NumPy for extension writers for a while. They haven't been as, as accessible. And Number Pro makes generalized u funks very accessible so that you can write them easily. And a lot of problems really can basically come down to writing a single generalized u funk that implements your use case and then 
parallelizes that, that computation. And then that maps to the GPU beautifully as well. So that's why we implemented GU Vectorize for the GPU, to really take advantage of all those cores. Thank you, Trophus. So let me, let's move forward to an example of a GU Vectorize. Just comment on that string. Oh, One yes. The big difference is the arguments are all raised now. Yes. So this is a batch matrix modification um, generalized U form that we are building. The core here, the function that we described in Python, it is computing a single matrix modification. When we apply the decorator, you can apply to uh, a list of matrices multiplying together. The main difference, Travis has mentioned, it, but I don't know if uh, everybody can hear that, is that um, we have this extra argument, the string to say uh, MN, MP to MP. So this describes the shape requirements, this is the type of shape signature. Um, the color may not be very visible, but this is the description of the shape signature required for this generalized u funk. And we make sure that. Uh, so the first array must have m by n is for the shape, m by p, and it must generate m by p, and it will check and be get if your array does not match this requirement. Here's analytic how we're just using it, and we are comparing it to a built-in uh, matrix multiply inside NumPy, the NumPy core you, you test. This is a built-in generalized UFO, right? Mm -hmm. One of the only ones that exists. Yes. <laughs> Just a little check, make sure the reset is the same. And the benchmark, we're going to put a two for million two by two matrices, a two, two by two matrix array. So there are four millions of these two by two matrices. But here you can see that at the time it's not very imp impressive, very similar. Uh, 126 milliseconds, 125 milliseconds. Yes. Remember, this is including all the memory transfer. So what if we uh, exclude those? So I'm going to show you how to move memory manually. And this will allow us to see the actual compute time on the GPU. So all these tools are in number open source number, you can, the first one is the device array-like. It is similar to the MP-like. It allocates GPU memory without initialization. It does not copy A to the GPU. So we create this DC, it's our output array. We have prepared the MP space for our, for our generalized view function to run and write research too. And then we have the two devices which takes any NumPy array and copy it, make a copy on the GPU. And it, this, it does the actual transfer. So what's the pure compute time? So we're going to do a benchmark again. We have to synchronize device synchronization to make sure uh, the work is done. It's written that any good expert here, they know that kernel call is asynchronous, so returning from a kernel call does not mean the result is written to um, the memory. And you see, now, with all the memory copy overhead, it is 9.25 milliseconds, a lot faster. Purely, the entire computation that takes 100 milliseconds. So some tips is, if you have like a sequence of your function to apply. You want to manually control where the data is, pin them on GPU until all your computation is done, and then you can enjoy the full power of the GPU. Moving on to the number pro could library bindings. These are the bindings to uh, libraries inside the CUDA toolkit. They are distributed, uh, they're distributable, so it, you get uh, 
curve when you download currently, you get the CUDA 5.5 version of these libraries. The bindings make sure NumPy arrays will work seamlessly with all the API calls from this library. So there's automatic memory transfer, all the memory is managed, so you don't have to worry about the, all this memory management. So we support QBLAS, a GPU version of BLAS. The QSPARS is sparse matrix support. QFFT, doing FFT on the QDA GPU. And QRAN, a random number generation library. Since we have limited time, I'm just going to show one example that will use the QFFT. We're going to do a convolution on the GPU. First, we import the library. It's in Number Pro, CUDA Lib, to get QFFT. And some other imports to make this happen. And these are all open source libraries in the Python ecosystem. In the FFT convolution, there's a complex array modification, and we're going to use to write that in Number Pro. So Number Pro do support complex numbers, uh, so there's a double precision, a double double complex number, and it's written for a GPU. And it's very simple. We just say A times B, and it knows that it's complex number, and it does the correct thing. Then we will prepare the image and a filter. The image is coming from uh, NumPy, it's distributed, or oh, SciPy. Uh, so it's distributed along, and we're going to use a Laplacian uh, filter, a 5x5. Five five. And then this is convolution on CPU using a uh, SciPy, uh, FFT Convolve. It takes about point, point zero 0.08 seconds. Then the GPU version. A bit more code here. It's really doing the device transfer. We're going to copy the image and the filter to the device. Then we're going to do the forward FFT in place using the crew FFT library. Apply our modification, complex modification uh, Ufunk on the GPU, do the inverse FFT in place. Finally, we copy the array back, do some normalization, and it's about four times faster, 0 0.02 seconds. That is including, again, including all the overhead of PCI transfers. The original picture. The CPU version is hard to see. You can see more clearly when you open the notebook yourself later and the GPU version. So, so far we have been talking about this high-level approach and both of these features are only available only in uh, the commercial number pro. Now we're going to talk about the low-level approach that is used building cooler kernels and and here you need to know a bit more uh, about the CUDA execution model. The execution model uh, includes several things. Is there a question? Okay. Um, first, when you decorate a function using uh, our number dot CUDA dot JIT decorator, it generates what in the CUDA programming world called a kernel. A kernel is only is visible to the host. You can call it from the CPU. But it cannot return any value. You have to use output arguments. So you should write to an array that is passed with uh, parameters. And when you launch a kernel, it creates a grid. A grid is, is a part of the execution hierarchy a grid is a group of blocks that can be 1 to 3D, and then your blocks, they are a group of threads that can be 1 to 3D. And every thread you create would execute the same kernel function. And they will all receive the same arguments. 
So you have to use this coordinate system with grid, block, and threads to determine the actual position of this thread so that it know what part of the work it is responsible for. And this is an image uh, coming from uh, uh, NVIDIA's programming guide that describes how its execution hierarchy looks like. So you have grid in the green box, the block in the yellow box. And inside each block, you have many threads. And this is a 2D view of potentially a 3D uh, coding system. And let us see how, it com how you compile CUDA kernel. And it's all in, done in number open source features. If you have used number before, uh, we have a Gigi decorator. And there's another version under the CUDA namespace and inside number. You provide the signature of the function. So this is a function that takes three arrays of single position float. And then you have your Python function. But now this looks very different. You have this CUDA.threadIDX and blockIDX. But these are built-ins to let you navigate inside that execution hierarchy we just mentioned, that thread block grid coordinate system. And the common pattern is to use this to map to your problem domain. So we are just going to map this coordinate system, flatten it into the indexes of our run the arrays. So you can find it out to this R order mapping. And then we have this part of code is, why are we checking? So you may ask, and we're going to show it later what it, what it is and then the actual work. What example, uh, what question is coming out is, why don't the examples have returns? Why are they always voids? That's one question that's emerging. These, these, JIT, these JIT examples always have void as a return. They don't oh. return anything. It's important to emphasize that right okay. now. So uh, as I mentioned before, all the CUDA kernel functions, so when you, okay, let me explain. Like, when you JIT uh, function, Python function for CUDA, the target setting is target to uh, CUDA, you are writing a function that maps directly to the execution model of, uh, of, the, of CUDA. And so there you're writing a kernel function. It has the restriction that it cannot return any value. That is how the CUDA architecture is designed. And it's also, the OpenCL also has the same uh, restriction. If I remember correctly. So basically the answer is it's because you're the hardware design, trying to deal with all those outputs, you're basically interacting at the lower level here. Mm -hmm. And so you have to manage output yourself. Yes. Right? And so all the kernels have no output. All the kernels have. Uh, the outputs must be passed as an argument, yes. so they cannot just return. Yes. And the detail will be uh, a CUDA kernel launch, when you call a kernel, it's asynchronous. So when those that are familiar with CUDA C, uh, after the launch, you re it returns immediately. But the kernel has not finished, so you can never actually get the return value. That you can synchronize, you, you can force the synchronization later and read the outputs from the global memory on the GPU. This is actually a common concept, uh, and it's being, when you ever talk about things happening in parallel, you have a lot of machines working, and you have kind of a control machine starting a job. This, this notion of these, these uh, workers are out there going to be doing some work, and I need to be able to move forward. This idea of asynchronicity emerges. So even in Python 3, you have this notion of a future kind of being returned from asynchronous events. These concepts are not unique or specific to CUDA or OpenCL. They're really concepts of I want to do a bunch of things in parallel. How do I organize my coding, my logic around that, and a, and a future or an asynchronous result? is one of those ways. Uh, so we definitely could put higher level constructs over this low level uh, code, which is uh, what Number Pro is about and what we're trying to do, even inside of Number as well. But we want to make available the low level ability to, from Python, 
write some of those routines. It actually would be fairly straightforward for somebody to write a high-level kind of interface to using CUDA Python to build that kind of future, to make it just a little easier to use. Because I agree, some of these interfaces can be a little bit um, less than uh, less friendly than, say, you know, adding uh, two NumPy arrays or doing a dot product on two NumPy arrays. So, uh, but step by step, uh, the, the first thing in Numba is the CUDA Python, and it has these restrictions due to the CUDA architecture and the realities of the multiple processors. Yes. Any trophies? Oh, go back to, okay, just compile it. So here's some more explanation about uh, what happened in the CUDA kernel, uh, the decorator, applying to the function, and then with this, all this code we just seen, they are, again, they are mapping thread block code into what I call a global position, a flattened linear address for this thread. And as number actually provides a shorthand for this very common task. You can simplify that to CUDA.grid, and one says treat this whole thing as 1D. Or you can have two, which we'll use later in the example for a 2D grid. And then we have this if block. This if block is to ensure the global position is within the range of the array that we have. And we will see later why we need that. And then the actual work. And we think there's quite a lot of boilerplates. plates. And that's why we have, um, and that's why we will have in number pro, this vectorize and show vectorize that helps you uh, so that you can write less code. But when you need to control the details, or your domain doesn't fit exactly the or generalized uh, UFUNC, and you may need to go back to this low level and pro program all the details yourself. So they they're launching the kernel. So, so we have the kernel build. It's ready. So how would they launch it? So first, we prepare the data. This is a very simple, this is a small array, just for demonstration. And then we calculate, uh, we need to calculate the thread and block count. And this is very unique to uh, programming GPUs for CUDA or even uh, OpenCL, is that you have to tell how many blocks, how many threads you are going to create in that, for that kernel. Remember, we have this execution hierarchy. And very often, you see code that uses here is use the what size of my GPU, what number of threads per block. And that is like a magic number, is related to the hardware and the performance guide always says make your threads per block be a multiple of what size and for the best performance. It's really like the the width of your CMD vectors on the CPU. And then you calculate the block size by depending on the number, number of elements, number of tasks you're in the process, and your thread count. And since we're doing this ceiling math here, you would very, most of the time you generate, you'll be launching more threads and blocks than there's actually data. That's why we need that if guard to prevent your bubble index accessing uh, out of bound memory. And here, for our example, we are launching 32 threads per block and four blocks per grid. And remember, a grid is associated to a kind of launch. And this is the actual code to, to, for doing the launch. Here, we um, overloaded the get item, the indexing notation syntax for the function to add the grid dimension and block dimension so the grid dimension is associated to the number of blocks, your block count, and the block dimension is associated with the threat per block. You need to configure your kernel before you call it, so the final call with the arguments afterwards. Your grid dimension can be a single integer or a tuple of, a one, two, three tuple of int representing a 1D, 2D, or 3D. The integer is always 1D by itself. Same for the block dimension. And this is the actual code that uses our VAD kernel. That is where, for the kernel, we're going to put 
the output to C, and ABC they are all NumPy arrays. And the kernel would also automatically do the transfer when you give it NumPy arrays. When you give it, when you auto, do automatic, uh, when you do manual transfer, you generate the device arrays. When you do that, you, you can fine tune when and where uh, memory transfer happens. And this is printing other results. Now I'm going to move to our We're going to move to our, our last example. And here I'm going to show a little bit about uh, menu caching. Let's skip through some uh, preparations, preparing constants. And here, first I'm going to show a naive version that does this NMWise operation. Each, each thread is going to do a row and a column, multiply them together. This is the naive code. Here's where we're going to use the CUDA degree for 2D. So we have a 2D problem. And then the rest is the modification code. It should, it should look very familiar. And then there's the optimized version that uses shared memory. And, we, and this algorithm also uses a blocking concept. So each time you have to, so the code will cache an entire row uh, this orange uh, box in, into the shared memory so that you don't have to go back to the global memory each time to load from the global memory. You're always loading from cache. And I'm going to move fairly quickly here, and you can look at this code later when we share the notebook. So, so we have the CUDA shared array to allocate a shared memory array within uh, this kernel of call. Okay. And, and then you're going to, the rest is the computation, fueling the cache. There's extra synchronization step that you must make, doing the computation, and, and then the synchronization, writing back the result. So I'm going to skip ahead to the actual benchmark result. So as you can see, with uh, the dark shared memory, it takes eight seconds on a 4800 by 4800 matrix. With shared memory, that's about almost two times faster. So with uh, CUDA Python, you can access to a low level construct uh, that is unique to the CUDA architecture and make your code uh, optimized for the hardware. Thank you, Sue. We're running out of time, but uh, we can stay on for those who wish to ask or ask questions for just a little bit longer. But we uh, we have a poll that I hope you have a chance to answer here. Uh, the first question really relates to Wakari. Uh, we showed Wakari a little bit as we showed you how that you'll be able to access this in order to try out these uh, examples, and that will give you access, for example, to this to this uh, IPython notebook. And you should all be able to see this IPython notebook. You won't have to copy anything. You should get access to it. And then you'll be able to you know, run all of the commands in that notebook. And it'll execute on a cloud GPU. So this, this question asks, basically, if now Wakari is a product that we sell, uh, Wakari Enterprise. But we were wondering if you had access to an AMI that lets you, in the Amazon Marketplace, quickly use Wakari to build out uh, uh, interactive environments. So you could share your work with others quickly and easily. Uh, using Python and using all the tools, would that be useful? Uh, that's the first question. Second is kind of what are the most important things to you for using GPU technology? What are you lacking? Is it the fact that you want to open CL support, you're concerned about CUDA? Uh, I will say a little bit about CUDA. CUDA is actually a fairly open concept. Um, Numba, our Numba interface to CUDA, allows us to target both CUDA and OpenCL at a high level uh, and in fact, CUDA Python could use OpenCL in the low, lowest level in order to, as part of its implementation. So my answer to are we going to support OpenCL is Numba's purpose is to target all hardware, whether it comes from NVIDIA or it comes from AMD, 
Numba is that level of interface. It's a language-based level of interface instead of a, um, a single uh, a library-based interface. Uh, but we are adding OpenCL support. How important is that to you? Available with more GPU libraries like CUBLOS, CURAND. Perhaps some of you are just waiting for NumPy and SciPy to automatically use the GPU. Uh, training courses, maybe you need more access to training, or perhaps you're interested in mobile applications. Uh, to answer that, you can have, ask, you can answer more than one, check more than one box. And then if there's any the topics you'd like to see a future webinar, please type your answer uh, to us as well. Uh, the summary here, I'd just like to thank Sue for going over some of the details. Uh, we've, I think we've created some interesting tools that are very, very useful. Some that are open source, and we'd like to move as much as we can to the open source space. <laughs> and then some that uh, our commercial partners help us build by buying those products from us. And uh, well, I think they can really help you. I think they can really help you take advantage of the GPUs quickly using the language we all enjoy, uh, the Python language, and interacting with the libraries that we're used to as well. In the future, <laughs> we're adding OpenCL support in Numba. The work in progress currently with the support of AMD. They're helping us do that. And then we're also adding a, an array object, basically a Numba array object that will act like a NumPy array and let you do array-oriented array like things, give you a deferred array object that then you can essentially stack computations that will then execute on the GPU quickly. Uh, and look for that in the coming in the coming months. I would say by the end of the year, we should have something working pretty well and the first cut at it here in a, in a few months. So uh, that's kind of the future of Numba, and I uh, hope you've enjoyed kind of this preview of what you can do with Numba. Do we have results of the poll you want to show people? We want to just hand that out in the uh, final. We will just send that out 